I am happy you've decided to join me for another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word. As you join me, you can hear the quality of my voice is a little strained, a little raspy. There's two reasons for that. Number one is I spent the last week uh, up in Niles, Michigan at Michigan Christian Service Camp working with some junior high campers. We had a great time studying about the power of God. But the other reason my voice is kind of raspy is because I apparently contracted COVID while I was with all those young people. So I'm sitting in my basement uh, trying to be in isolation and dealing with some of the minor symptoms uh, that have come because of that. Now, since we believe God is outside of time, you feel free to pray for my situation because I know that God hearing you in my future will bless me in your past. Let's go ahead and open our scriptures today to where we left off last, which is the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to start at the very beginning of chapter 13. Now, remember the situation is that Nehemiah came back as the appointed Jewish governor of Judea. He was appointed by Artaxerxes for the specific purpose of rebuilding the walls. And he got that done in about 52 days, uh, even though there was uh, a lot of uh, trouble uh, from those living to the north of them, uh, non-Israelis, in trying to finish that work. But they also had some issues that were repeats of problems that happened when Ezra first came back. And that is the intermarrying with non-Israelis living in the region. The problem was not ethnicity, but rather religion. Uh, When you have a faithful Jewish line intermarrying with an unfaithful non-Jewish line, too often the false faith overcomes the truth. And so that is absolutely forbidden. In the New Testament, we talk about this idea of not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't do it. Uh, It's a bad idea. Uh, But one of the things that they learned in the days of Nehemiah is found at the beginning of chapter number 13. Let's read it. It says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. Now that's talking about uh, the public reading of Moses' books, at least the book of Deuteronomy, possibly all five of his books, in association with the dedication of the wall and the start of a sabbatical year. So they're reading and reading and reading, and it says, in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Baalam Baalam against them to curse them. And yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. And so that goes all the way back, Book of Numbers uh, story, where uh, the Moabites couldn't take on the Israelis uh, by physical numbers. So they tried to curse them in the spirit world. And... uh, Excuse me, the king of Moab um, was not happy that the prophet Baalam could not um, curse the Israelis. Uh, So Baalam told him, hey, all you have to do is throw a little party for your God and uh, invite the younger Israelis, men and women, to come and join you in the worship, which included uh, lots of music and drinking, and having sexual relations. Uh, And so uh, he said, if you get the Israelis to go along with that, then God himself will curse them. And that's exactly what happened. So at that time, God said that no people from those nations involved in that, the Ammonites and the Moabites, could come into the worship area of the Israelis, that is the temple area. Uh, And uh, that 
could only be overcome by a complete uh, conversion experience. Uh, for example, Ruth comes from the Moabite people, but she became the ancestress of first David and then later of Jesus uh, because she had converted to the true faith. So she was no longer really a Moabite. She was an adopted Israeli. And so that's uh, something to uh, keep in mind uh, when we're reading through this. So the point is, they had recently been read on all of that. And verse 3, as soon as the people in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, as soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. So they told them, hey, you can't be coming into our temple area uh, and uh, mixing with us because you're not a true believer in the one and only God. Now we get to the big point. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that the uh, dedication of the wall, when those things were read, that happened in the seventh Jewish month of 444 BC. Uh, that was the beginning of 139th sabbatical year. So in the fall of 444 BC, uh, Nehemiah had recently arrived as the governor of the region. Now, at some point, 11 years later, in 433 BC, he went back to King Artaxerxes. And something happens while he's gone that is related to this foreigners in the temple thing. Verse number four. Now, before this, and that's related to the story that's following, if you will. Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah. Now, let's get our minds wrapped around this. Eliashib is a priest, apparently the high priest in the time of Nehemiah. So he has control of the property of the temple area. And that would include the shrine building itself, the, the place where the most holy place is located, and then the Holy of Holies where the priests do all their work, and the wraparound on three sides uh, annex uh, where they kept things. This is the three-story many, many roomed annex that wrapped around three sides of the shrine building, accessed from the outside of the shrine building. Uh, what was supposed to be in there would be things like uh, priestly clothing, uh, articles to be used in worship, uh, bowls, uh, treasury items for uh, the temple, uh, olive oil, grain, things of that sort. And so, instead, something else is done with some of those rooms. It's, uh, now, Tobia is mentioned earlier in the book. He's a Moabite, or excuse me, an Ammonite. So, he's a foreigner. But some of the people were related to him by marriage. Now, we thought we'd taken care of that, but apparently not. Eliashib who's related to him by marriage, still feels a connection to him. And as soon as Nehemiah was gone, this is what happens. Verse 5, he prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. Now, while this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king, uh, and then after some time, I asked leave of the king to come back. Now, we'll get to that in a moment. So, let's get our, get our idea straight in our head here. At some point, 
after 433 BC, within probably a few months of Nehemiah leaving, the high priest allows Tobiah the Ammonite, his related by marriage uh, relative, to actually set up an apartment in the storage room area around the temple shrine building. He's actually living in the holy area. And the stuff that's supposed to be there, who knows where it's at. Uh, We're going to find out that they're not even uh, collecting it like they're supposed to be uh, for the use of the priests and Levites. So we are totally blowing off God's word, totally blowing off everything uh, that Nehemiah had been teaching while he was there in leadership for about 11 years. Now, we don't know when he comes back, but it's got to be before 424 BC because that's the year King Artaxerxes dies. And we know that he is able to get back in charge of Judea by asking King Artaxerxes to send him back. So let's get back to that again. It says, I went to the king, this is verse 6, and after some time I asked leave of the king and I came to Jerusalem. So here he comes back. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. So the first thing that he takes note of is this apartment uh, being kept with the permission of the priest, this apartment being kept by an Ammonite unbeliever in some of the storage rooms right next door to the temple shrine building. What does he do? I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. And I think he actually did that himself. So if you can kind of picture this guy, he comes charging into uh, this apartment in the storage area and he starts grabbing things and he's taking them out and just throwing them outside. He doesn't care whether he breaks them or not because this stuff never should have been in in the first place. Takes out clothing, throws it out in the courtyard. He's just emptying this place of all of these household goods of Tobiah. And then verse 9, I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. So they probably used the holy water uh, that was uh, part of the ceremonies uh, in the temple uh, uh, procedures. And so they clean these chambers up again and says, I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So he puts back in place the things that were supposed to be in those storage rooms. Then he discovers some other things. Verse 10. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. Now, the way it's supposed to work is that there's six years of work, just like there's six days of work each week. There's six years of work, and each of those years, the Jewish people bring their tithes to local storehouses, to the Levites in their towns, or to the temple building, to the Levites there. And then from that tithe, the Levites give a tenth to the priests that work uh, for God. And these things are kept in storage, especially over the sabbatical seventh year when nobody's doing work. And the priests and the Levites, when they're on duty at the temple building, are eating out of these stored up tithes. Well, apparently the high priest was not being judicious in keeping enough things stored at the temple for the use of the priests and Levites. So what's happened is some of the priests and Levites have said, 
well, I'm not going to go and do work at the temple and starve to death or have my family starve to death. I need to go out and work my own agricultural area so that my family can fend for itself. And so what happens is they were neglecting God's work in order to feed their family. And so, verse 11, Nehemiah writes, I confronted the officials and I said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Now, he's not just simply talking about allowing foreigners to move into an apartment in the storage area. He's also saying, why aren't you taking care of the priests and the Levites in their work? They should not having have to be going out there and working a secular job to feed their families. They should be able to be in their service to God's work. And so the rest of the verse says, I gathered them together and set them in their stations. And then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. Now you might remember the last big book we did, um, separate from the historical uh, stories we've been telling, was the book of Malachi. And I told you that I think it fits the time period between Nehemiah going back to the king of Babylon, back to the king of uh, the Persian Empire, and his second tenure as the leader uh, for Persia in Judea. And one of the reasons I gave you was because the tithing problems that were being dealt with in the book of Malachi were clearly evident when Nehemiah came back. And so this is the verse that I had in mind for that. So he fixes that. He tells everybody, you've got to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse because these guys have got to be fed in order for them to do their work for the Lord and for the people. And so he brings that all back in again. And verse 13, I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shalamiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites, and as their assistant, Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, and uh, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Uh, so you have to have good administrators to get this stuff done properly. And so Nehemiah uh, appoints these guys, and they then take care of it. Verse 14, uh, the little prayer thing that pops up from time to time in Nehemiah's writings. He says, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for his service. So he asks God to remember his hard work on behalf of the temple. Verse 15, we're still not done with him correcting things. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine presses, which tells us what time of year it is. It's the summertime. It's the end of the summer, which is the time of vintage, because grapes have come to their peak ripeness, and the people have gone out and cut those bunches of grapes off, and they're bringing them to the wine presses to uh, stomp on them and turn them into the vintage for that year. So in those days, I saw in Judah people trading wine presses on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath day is not being kept by these people now uh, because Nehemiah wasn't there making sure that it happened because this high priest, Eliashib, must be worthless. Uh, as a religious leader. And they were bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys. Now, the grain had all been harvested by the time the summer uh, was at its peak, but it's sitting around in storage heaps, and now it's being moved around on the Sabbath day, which is what he's objecting to. And also wine, which would be in containers, 
grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So they're bringing things that are appropriate for sale and eating and trade. Uh, You can have them in the marketplaces with no problem at all. But they're having market day on the Sabbath day, which is a big no-no according to the Mosaic Code. So, Nehemiah says, I warned them on that day when they sold food. So, I told them, basically, knock that nonsense off. There's six days that you do work, including market. Seventh day, take the day off, just like everybody's supposed to, and in that day, worship. Now, Tyrians also, people from the city of Tur, up to the north and uh, east, or north and west of Jerusalem, up uh, on the Phoenician coast. Tyrians also who lived in the city, that is in the city of Jerusalem apparently, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. So we've got foreign nationals that are selling uh, probably salted or dried fish and other Uh, goods on the Sabbath day. And this is all happening with the approval of the high priest Eliashib and the leaders uh, and all the different uh, groups of the Judeans, uh, like the tribal leaders and the city leaders. So that's why verse 17 says, then I confronted the nobles of Judah, and said to them, What is this evil that you're doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way? Did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you're going to bring more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So he is concerned that there's going to be a big repeat uh, of God's judgment because this is how it all started, by totally blowing off God's word. Verse 19, as soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, so from about three o'clock after, that's, you know, the, the declining part of the day, I commanded that the door should be stu- shut and gave orders that should not be opened until after the Sabbath. Now, that when they rebuilt the city and they dedicated it, remember he told them to keep the doors shut until the sun was well up. And then they were to shut them in the evening uh, after the sun uh, went down, apparently. But now he's modifying that for the Sabbath day, the preparation of the Sabbath day. Remember, Sabbath days begin when the sun sets. And so he says, I want the gates closed early on Sabbath Eve to get, give everybody the chance to head home. Interesting, in modern-day Israeli society, things start shutting down early on Friday afternoon so that when the sun goes down, everybody's already home. Uh, so, verse 20, Then the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. So, you know, they've been doing this for a while now. And so they're just kind of hanging out, seeing if maybe things can get back to their, quote, normal, end quote, and they can sell on the Sabbath day. (coughs) But uh, I warned them and said to them, why are you lodging outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you, meaning I will arrest you and deal with you if you keep thinking you're going to sell on the Sabbath day. And from that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And then I commanded the Levites they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God. Spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. So the intermarriage problem again. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, And they couldn't speak the language of Judah, but the language of each people. Now, Judah at this time, the language was Aramaic. That's what they came back uh, from Persia speaking. I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. (coughs) 
<clears throat> the reason for this is because they're not raising their kids as Jews. And I made them take oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, <coughs> excuse me, foreign women made even him to sin. And you can go back and read that story uh, in the Kings. I think it's 1 Kings uh, 11. That uh, Solomon's love, commitment to non-believing foreign nationals ended up causing him to abandon his relationship with God. And so Nehemiah is warning them, this is how it starts, being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't do this. Raise your kids to believe in the true faith. Verse 27. Shall we then listen to you, <coughs> excuse me, and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign wives? The answer, of course, is no. One of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite, another foreign national. Therefore, I chased him from me because he wouldn't break that relationship with non-believers. Verse 29, Remember them, O oh my God, because they've desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Uh, keep that in mind for our transition stories that are coming up next. And thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I establish the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work, and I provided the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. And amen to that, Nehemiah. May God continue to bless your memory as we read your word. Come back next week, and we will dive into the transition time between the Old and New Testaments.